Okay, uh, for this build, and actually build's probably not the appropriate word, assembly is probably a better word. Um, I just wanted to go through all the parts and the different things that we're going to need to put this together. Uh, so here is a Raspberry Pi 3B. It's not the B+. Plus. Um, I've had this for about a year, and uh, it's worked out uh, pretty well for me, but... Um, I did want to upgrade to the Raspberry Pi 3B. Uh, my other hotspot, which works fine, is right here. And uh, this one is built off of a similar MM DVM board. And we'll talk about that. Uh, but it's on a Raspberry Pi Zero. And it's not that this is a problem or underperforms. Uh, it ha I use this a lot. And it has locked up a few times. And when I say a few times, I'm talking about two or three. And I don't know what caused that, if it was a performance issue, if it was a board issue, if it was a Pi Zero issue, or what could have possibly been uh, been the cause of that. But the reason I'm going with a little bit of a larger um, or more powerful uh, CPU and board is, is that I may run other applications on this other than just the software required to run the MMDVM. So when we talk about the MMDVM, um, it's a multi-mode digital voice modem. Uh, and what it does is it takes uh, data off of the internet, you know, ones and zeros, and uh, basically converts them into an audio stream. Now, people say, well, DMR is a digital mode, and it is, but the audio stream is a digital audio stream, right? So it needs to be modulated and demodulated, and that's why you need uh, something like this multi-mode modem. So when I got this one, uh, I just bought a complete kit. It, ca it came together, and then I added this case, which is from uh, C4 Labs. C4 Labs, uh, they, make, they make great stuff, and so here's their card. I can't say enough nice, nice things about them. They make fantastic cases for Raspberry Pis. Uh, the one that we're going to use in this particular build or assembly is actually my third case from them. Uh, great company to work with. They make great products. Zero problems there. Now this is why I call this an assembly more than a build, and this is because my modem board I actually ordered, uh, it came with the antenna mount, the SMA antenna mount already soldered onto the board, uh, you can see that there, and it had the OLED already soldered to the board, so I didn't have to do any work there. Um, so basically it came pre-assembled, I basically just need to plug this into the Raspberry Pi Zero. If I broke out the soldering iron, which is uh, right here. Um, if I did that, then I would probably call this a build as opposed to an assembly. But anyhow, what we want to do is we want to take this and we want to attach it to the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, when you take a look at this, it looks like it's pretty well constructed. Uh, pretty happy with it. Let's just talk about the uh, the cost of something like this. This board was about 48 bucks. This Raspberry Pi 3 was about $30, uh, $35, I think. The uh, the modem did come with an antenna, so I didn't have to purchase that. And then the case from C4 Labs was $30. Bucks. Uh, and then you talk about $10 for your micro SD card, so you're talking around $115, $125 bucks shipping and all that stuff included to put one of these together, which really isn't that bad. And um, we're going to use this, like I use my other one, to talk on my uh, DMR digital uh, handheld radio and I've got a lot of videos on this so anyhow let's go ahead and get started with the assembly one of the things that you want to be careful about is if you take a look at where the OLED is soldered to your modem these are very clean and they're short uh, mount points sometimes these pins come out a little bit too far and they'll actually make contact with the GPIO pins on your Raspberry Pi and that's it that's an issue you could cause uh, signaling problems, you could cause contact problems, you could cause shorting problems. Uh, with this one I'm pretty lucky. Now I've already pre-assembled this outside of the case and tested it with uh, with this particular card and it worked so I'm lucky. So we're not going to show the testing of that as part of this build but we'll show the build in completion so you'll know how to do it yourself. So what you want to do is you want to take these GPIO connection uh, connectors I guess is what they're called and then you want to make sure that you carefully, carefully seat them onto your Raspberry Pi. You want to make sure everything is lined up. And then just firmly but gently go ahead and push these down. And, you want, and I'm messing it up. Watch, watch me ruin the board. 
but you just want to make sure that you kind of do this in a uniform manner and in a consistent manner and we're done and so what we do is we want to take a look there and you can see the OLED pins are not touching which is a good thing the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to peel this protective case off I'm sorry protective cover off I posted some pictures on Instagram and I was getting some grief about that still being on there um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to assemble the C4 Labs case right now. And this takes a while because you have to peel the paper off of each layer and that's a little bit of a pain. And then I'm going to need to follow these instructions. So I'm not going to record that. It's not worth recording. Anybody can do it. So we'll come back in a little bit and see how it turned out. Alright folks, so here's the finished product. A um, couple things I did want to talk about is this hat did not fit in here um, exactly correct. So I did have to do some Dremel work nothing uh, cumbersome it was very easy to do it wasn't a problem this um, case is sold to fit the jumbo spot I'm sorry the zoom spot not the jumbo spot this is the jumbo spot and that might have something to do with it <clears throat> I think the dimensions for those hats are very similar so I was surprised that I had to Dremel off as much as I did but uh, in my experience putting Raspberry Pi cases together especially with other components you're often left uh, to be creative with a with a Dremel tool. The other thing that I want to point out real quick, because I mean this does look awesome, right? Was one other problem: the Zoom Spot didn't have uh, an OLED display um, in the advertisement for this case, so that made this hat a little bit taller. And one small problem I've got right here is a gap, and the plexiglass is bent. So I'm going to remedy remedy this by putting a couple of spacers underneath this one, um, which really shouldn't be a problem. Anyhow, now that it is put together, uh, let's go ahead and build a Pi Star card, throw it in here, and do a little bit of testing. In order to install the Pi Star operating system, you're going to need to download an image file and flash it to an SD micro card. You do this by going to the pistar.uk website. There'll be a link below. Then go to the download section and click Download Pi Star. Once you do this, you'll see the different images that are available for download. There's a section for information that tells you a little bit about each image. What we want to do is make sure that we select the image for the Raspberry Pi. So from the list, we are going to go ahead and pick the image that is specified for the Raspberry Pi. And then we just download. This is going to take a while, so we'll come back when it's done. The image downloads in a zip file. So once it's complete, we want to open the, the zip file and then extract the image. Okay, now that the file has expanded, we're going to go ahead and we're going to browse to the .img file. And then we're going to copy that to our desktop. That'll make it a little bit easier to find when we go ahead and write the image to the SD microcard. Using an adapter, I'm going to go ahead and insert the micro SD card into the SD card slot on my laptop computer. When I do this, I'll see an icon appear on the desktop. It's titled No Name. The next thing I want to do is open up Etcher. That is the program that we are going to use to write the image to the micro SD card. Once the Etcher application is running, I want to pick Select Image and then browse to the image file that I saved on my desktop. I'm going to select the image file and then you'll see that appear inside the application. Etcher has already selected my micro SD card for the target. I can change it if I want to, but I'm not going to. You want to make sure that you pick the right drive for this because you can't undo it. Next, I'm going to click Flash, and it's going to start the process. This takes a while, so we'll come back when it's done. Etcher will flash the drive, then it will verify the contents, and then unmount the disk when it's done. Once that's done, we're going to take the disk, insert it into our Raspberry Pi, and then boot the Raspberry Pi the way that we normally would. Okay, so let's put the SD card into our hotspot and then boot it up. I'm going to connect to the hotspot from my Raspberry Pi desktop. The hotspot will emit a Wi-Fi access point called Pi Star Setup, 
we're going to go ahead and use the password Raspberry to connect. Once we connect, we'll be able to go to a browser and type in pi-star.local as the URL. We're going to be presented with the Pi Star interface. It's pretty blank right now because it says no mode defined. We need to go in and configure our Pi Star. Let me maximize the window. After a few seconds, we're going to be presented with an authentication page. The username is pi-star and the password is raspberry. Go click login and then you'll be presented with a configuration screen. From this configuration screen, we'll be able to make the settings necessary to use our Pi Star. Here you can see information about the Pi Star, the host name which can be changed, the kernel version, and our platform. It's also pretty handy, it tells you the temperature that your Pi is operating at in case it overheats. The first thing we're going to look at is our control software. No changes need to be made. In the event that I did make changes, I want to make sure to click the Apply Changes button. You need to do that for each section. After you do that, the Pi Star interface will reload all configuration settings. Here I get a message saying to make sure that I reload my modem type. I'll show you how to do that in a few seconds. Just click OK and then we'll go back to the Pi Star configuration page. The next thing is we're going to look at our MMDVM configuration settings. You can see that there's a variety of modes. We're interested in DMR. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to toggle that switch on. The next thing I'm going to do is come down and take a look at my MMDVM display type. I want to make sure that I select OLED as my board has an OLED display. I'm going to check and make sure that my port's correct, and it is. And then there's a various layouts that you can play around with. I just leave it on the default because that works for me. Oh yeah, I want to make sure that I go ahead and click Apply Changes and then go through the reload of the configuration items once again. Once the page is reloaded, I'm going to go down to General Configuration at this point. Here's where you can change the host name of your Pi Star. Enter in your call sign. I'm not going to put mine in because yours is going to be different. Enter your DMR ID. Sometimes people put a suffix of 01 or 02 on here. Go ahead and type in a frequency that you want to use. Make sure your frequency is in accordance to your local rules and regulations. You also want to make sure that it doesn't interfere with any satellite communications. You can put a URL in, such as your QRZ page, or I don't know, maybe your Hotmail. The next thing you want to do is pick your modem type. I use STM32-DVM for the Raspberry Pi hat GPIO. You can also set your time zone. As you see, they're all in here. And then the next thing you want to do is pick a keyboard language. I'm going to pick English US. Then once again, click Apply Changes and reload the configuration. Once again, the configuration page reloads. And we want to go down to the DMR configuration settings. Here you can see different DMR masters or Brandmeister servers. We're going to go down and we're going to pick one from the US list. It really doesn't matter which one you pick. Also, you can configure your color code. This is the color code that you use on your radio to communicate with your hotspot. When you're finished, go ahead and click Apply Changes and wait for the configuration page to load again. The last configuration setting we need to make is your Wi-Fi network. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and then you can click on the Configure Wi-Fi button. You can set this up to connect to your home network or to a mobile hotspot, such as a cell phone hotspot or portable Wi-Fi interface. Also, you can change the default password. The next thing I want to do is make you aware of some settings in the Expert Configuration page. Once you enter the expert interface, you receive a warning. What we're going to do here is we're going to click on the settings for the MMDVM. When this happens, you'll see a lot of changes that you have made to your configuration page. You can make those changes here, but it's a little riskier. Also, you want to make sure that you click apply changes whenever you make an update. What I want to show you is a little bit further down, and it's under the router interface. Here you have an RX offset and you have a TX offset. You may need to change these values in the event that you have trouble transmitting to or receiving from your hotspot. In most cases, if you have trouble receiving from your hotspot, you're going to have to adjust the TX interface on your MMDVM modem. Make these changes in small increments. That way it'll be easier for you to tune in or dial down the right setting for your configuration. Oddly enough, on my two hotspots, I did not need to make any changes here.
When done, you want to make sure to click Apply Changes for those changes to take effect. From the main configuration page, you're also going to be able to go in and back up and restore your configuration in the event that it becomes necessary. Once your configuration is up and running and working correctly, it makes good sense to go ahead and do a backup. That way, if you have an SD card failure or something else happens, you'll be able to restore your configuration. So go ahead and click on Backup and Restore. It's a pretty simple user interface. Clicking the down arrow will download a copy of your configuration to a zip file on your local computer. When you're done working with your hotspot, you can click on the power option from the menu and you can either reboot it or power down. It makes sense to power off your hotspot this way. That way your Raspberry Pi shuts down gracefully and you do not risk any corruption on the SD card. Once you click this button, a command will be sent to the Pi Star to shut it down and you're presented with this interface. Anyhow, that's really it folks. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to answer. I'd like to say thanks for watching this video, I really appreciate it. If you want to see more content of a similar nature, go ahead and click thumbs up or subscribe.